Hi folks, uh, hope you're having a great day. Today I want to talk to you about an issue that is a common problem in English grammar when people are trying to sound correct, and that's the concept of agreement. This means that certain words are kind of paired up together and they have to fit. The two types of agreement in English are subject verb agreement and pronoun antecedent agreement. In a sentence, the subject and the verb kind of have to match. In English, this generally isn't an issue with the simple past tense as the verb form stays the same regardless of the subject. Take a look at these examples. I played basketball. We played basketball. They played basketball. He played basketball. It's the same thing no matter what the subject is. However, in the present tense, the simple present, the verb changes form based on the subject whether it's singular or plural, and whether it's first, second, or third person. I play basketball, we play basketball, they play basketball, he plays basketball. In regular verbs, third person singular subjects take an S ending in the simple present tense. However, some verbs, especially really common ones like to be, are irregular. They take different forms. I am optimistic. We are optimistic. They are optimistic. He is optimistic. It's important to be able to identify the subject. Once you understand the idea of verb forms, you need to make sure that you're matching it to the correct word. In some sentences, finding the subject can be tricky. This is especially true when there are prepositional phrases between the subject and the verb. Here are some sentences that have subject verb problems because of these interrupting prepositional phrases. The pages from this book is torn. The writing in those paragraphs are interesting. The road between the houses are dirty. The birds in the tree is singing. The words from, in, and between are some of the most common prepositions, but there are a lot more. Learning to recognize prepositional phrases based on their construction and how they're used in sentences is super helpful. That way, even if you're not sure a word is a preposition, you can still make sure your sentences are constructed correctly. Prepositional phrases between the subject and verb give additional description about the subject, but the sentence would be complete without them. Removing the prepositional phrase will simplify the sentence and help us hear the match between the subject and verb. So let's look at those sentences again. The pages from this book is torn. We can remove the prepositional phrase from this book and still have a complete sentence because that phrase just tells us which specific pages the sentence is talking about, the ones from this book. However, when we look at the sentence, the pages is torn, it's pretty clear that the subject and verb don't match. The subject, pages, requires a matching verb, which should be not is, but are. So the shortened version of this sentence would be, the pages are torn. And the corrected version of the original would be, the pages from this book are torn. We can follow the same process for the other sentences in that section. The writing in those paragraphs are interesting becomes, the writing are interesting, which becomes, the writing is interesting. So it should be, the writing in those paragraphs is interesting. When we shorten the road between the houses are dirty, it becomes the road are dirty. That should be the road is dirty, which means the original sentence should be the road between the houses is dirty. For the sentence, the birds in the tree is singing, we shorten it to the birds is singing. Nope, that needs to be the birds are singing, which means the original sentence should be the birds in the tree are singing. In some cases, it can be difficult to tell whether the subject should be classified as singular or plural. I'm going to give you some guidelines to follow. If you notice any problems with these, or if you have any questions or other examples you're not sure about, please leave them in the comments, and I will give more explanation in a reply. Non-count nouns are things we don't usually, well, count. Some examples are things like ink, money, water, rice, sugar, coffee, meat, furniture, homework, and weather. They don't have a plural form, nor do they require a plural form for the verb. When we want to refer to how much of them we have, we use words like some, much, a little, or a lot, rather than words that indicate number, like several or many. Here are some examples. The milk has spilled. The furniture needs to be repaired. Indefinite pronouns, such as anybody, none, everyone, some, or all, are words that refer to an indeterminate noun. Most take a singular verb. However, there are a few like the pronoun most in the previous sentence, that clearly refer to a plural group. Those take a plural verb. You wouldn't say, he take a walk, but he takes a walk. 
But it's pretty clear that most takes a singular verb is incorrect, and it should be most take a singular verb. However, there are some indefinite pronouns that can refer to a singular noun or to a group. In those cases, the context given will help you decide whether the verb should take its singular or its plural form. This is where those prepositional phrases come in really handy. Consider these examples. All of the puppies have soft ears. All of the milk has spilled. As we saw before, the prepositional phrases here of the puppies and of the milk provide additional information. Even though they're not structurally necessary, puppies and milk are not the subject of these sentences. In both cases, the subject is the indefinite pronoun all. However, the information provided by those prepositional phrases helps us to decide whether you use have or has for the verb. I'll try to remember to include links to information about indefinite pronouns down in the description. But if I forget, or if you don't find those uh, links helpful, then you can just search for some that work for you or make a request in the comments. Compound subjects are also tricky. When they're joined with and, they're usually plural. Zoe and Jake play basketball. This one's pretty straightforward, but it has a few exceptions. In some cases, the nouns joined with and actually form a single compound noun. Take a look at the sentence, peaches and cream is my favorite flavor of ice cream. The context of this sentence makes it pretty clear that peaches and cream is one thing, one flavor, not two separate ones. Another exception is when the compound subjects are preceded by each or every. Each dog and cat needs a collar. Every dog and cat needs a collar. You can tell from the context that they're being referred to as individuals. Every single one of them needs a collar. On the other hand, compound subjects that are joined with or or nor take a verb that agrees with the word that's closer to the verb. This one's tricky, and it's hard to remember as it doesn't really occur all that often. But once you get the hang of it, it's pretty clear cut. Consider these examples. You or your friends need to explain what happened. Neither the cheerleaders nor the basketball team wants to clean gum off the bleachers. In both cases, the word that's closer to the verb in the subject determines the form of the verb. You also have to watch out for inverted sentences. Questions often have the subject coming after the verb. So do statements that begin with here or there, is, are, was, or were. Here are a couple of examples to give you the idea. Is each of the students finished with the worksheet? Here is one of the books you requested. Notice that in each case, you have to look at what the subject is. In both cases, in the first, the subject is each. Each is. Students are plural, but we're talking about them as individuals as indicated by the subject, the indefinite pronoun each. In the case of the second sentence, here is one of the books you requested. The subject is not books, but one. There's only one book here. This is the one I'm talking about. There are some other issues, but they're pretty rare, and we still need to talk about the second type of agreement, which is pronoun antecedent agreement. The antecedent of a pronoun is the noun to which the pronoun is referring. So, in the sentence, Mrs. Cole is still not done with her lesson. The antecedent of the pronoun her is the noun Mrs. Cole. In this case, we have a possessive pronoun. The word her is connected to lesson. However, her refers to Mrs. Cole. So the antecedent is the noun Mrs. Cole. Pronouns need to match the antecedent to which they refer in person, first, second, or third, number, singular, or plural, and gender. For an explanation of first, second, and third person pronouns, look at the video I've linked below in the description. Number works very similarly for pronoun forms as it does with verb forms, but you still got to pay careful attention to the antecedent in some situations such as these. Non-count and compound nouns. These nouns follow the same rules for pronoun agreement that they do for subject-verb agreement. Non-count nouns typically use a singular form. Compound nouns joined by and take a plural pronoun unless joining them forms a new cohesive unit, like peaches and cream earlier. Compound nouns joined by or or nor match the form of the noun that's closest to the pronoun. This is probably the trickiest one, so consider the following examples. Sarah and Jim are working at their restaurant this weekend. In this case, there refers to both Sarah and Jim. They own the restaurant together. So the pronoun is plural, just like the verb. Neither the teacher nor the students have their identification cards yet. Students is plural. That's the only one that we consider when we take a look at the verb 
and the pronoun there. Both of them have to take their plural forms because students is closer to both the verb and to the pronoun. However, when we flip that, we get a more challenging situation. Neither the students nor the teacher has an identification card yet. So let's talk about that last example. Third person singular is the only category of pronouns in English that is further divided. These pronouns can be feminine, she, her, hers, masculine, he, him, his, or object, it, its. Notice that the third category is not neutral like it is in German. The pronoun it and its imply that you are not referring to a person, but a thing. This is important in that third example, because the gender of the teacher was not indicated through context, but a teacher is a person, not an object. I know. Sometimes it seems like teachers are heartless, unthinking robots, but I promise you, that's not actually the case. The most traditional way to set up a pronoun that refers to a person whose gender has not been identified is to use he or she, or some variation, depending on whether it's subject, object, or possessive. But it always ends up sounding clunky and awkward, so I find the best solution is just to avoid it entirely. In the example above, I used an article instead of a possessive pronoun, and it works just fine. So if you have any questions about this concept, you know what to do. Put them in the comments. Indefinite pronouns. Indefinite pronouns, like everybody, much, several, each, or someone, like we talked about with verbs, can also be used as antecedents. They take singular or plural pronouns in the same way that they take singular or plural verb forms. Here are some examples. Each of the bottles has a bump on its lid. Each is always singular. It takes a singular verb, has, and a singular pronoun, its. Each of the students should open a textbook. Each is always singular, remember. However, since students are people, but their gender has not been identified, we can get around this issue by using an article instead of a possessive pronoun. This sounds smoother than the sentence, each of the students should open his or her textbook. <sighs> Several of the cats have white patches on their fur. Several is always plural, and it takes a plural verb, have, and a plural pronoun, there. Some of the markers are missing their caps. Some can be singular or plural. The prepositional phrase of the markers shows that it's plural, takes a plural verb, are, and a plural pronoun, there. Some of the salt is still in its shaker. Again, some can be singular or plural. The prepositional phrase of the salt shows that it's singular and takes a singular verb, is, and a singular pronoun, its. So, if you have difficulty with this concept, don't worry. You are in good company. It's kind of complex, but once you get the hang of it, if you pay attention, and if you check your work, you'll be just fine. In the description, I've included links to a few resources that I've found helpful. The fact that this is relatively common means that if you don't learn this, you're going to be making kind of a lot of mistakes. On the other hand, if you check your writing, you'll have lots of opportunities to practice using agreement correctly, and people will be very impressed. At least, they should be. And, of course, you can always post a comment in which you demonstrate your understanding. And I will gladly tell you how impressed I am with you. So, I hope you understand. I hope this was helpful. And thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.